Thank you for joining us for a final round of breakout sessions today. Um, I'm excited to introduce you to a couple of my colleagues, and we're going to have a really fun session here to close the day. Uh, we're calling Ask the SolarWorks Ex Experts. And today we'll be answering your questions about SolarWorks and about design as best we can. Um, so go easy on us. We'll, <laughs> we'll do our best here. Um, but we, I think we've got a ton of great stuff from you. So there's four of us here today, and I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues. Uh, Tim Newton is our first speaker. He's uh, been in the, the CAD industry for uh, 20 years plus. Uh, Tim told me that he'd never been on social media, um, but I did take that photo from his LinkedIn profile, so I'm not sure if that's an accurate. I'd noticed that, yeah. <laughs> I think it was Facebook, Glenn, but... <laughs> Also with us is, is Jared Kuntz. Jared is out of Texas. Uh, he's on our enterprise service team and is a PDM and electrical and SolarWorks PCB export, expert. He's a big Star Wars fan. He told me he's got a boxer named Boba Fett. I'm assuming that's a dog, Jared, and not a small human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A third up, Garrett Klein. Garrett is out of Idaho. He's been using CAD for 25 years, starting with AutoCAD, right, Garrett? And and all the way through everything else. He shared, yep. uh, as we're preparing for this, that he used to des design ski lifts and gondolas. And I now have a list of every resort that Garrett has designed a gondola on, and <laughs> we'll not be going there. That's a good plan. Good plan. <laughs> And last up is myself. My name is Glenn White. I've been doing this uh, in the SolarWorks channel for about 16 years. And last year, my claim to fame was that I sank a sailboat. So with that... <laughs> so no sailing with Glenn then. Yeah, do not do that. Not a good idea. I've given up sailing. <laughs> so this session was inspired by a, a new service we've started offering uh, called Ask an Expert. Uh, we're finding that so many of our discussions with customers over technical support turned into conversations that really need a, a real in-depth uh, consultation where you really get into a feature. So we, we put together this package, make it easier for our customers to ask for those in-depth sessions. And uh, you can really get in touch with us to talk about whatever you want, whether it's uh, CAD operations like setting up templates and sheet formats or using Design Checker or whatever it might be making a plan for analysis or um, strategies and workflows and data management. And so it's part of our elite subscription uh, offering, and you can just go to our website and make a request if you're interested. But it was good inspiration for this session. So how today is going to work is that we've been fielding questions all day in the Ask an Expert Lounge. Okay, and we've got a few that have been shared there. We really appreciate those from the team. Um, but in the right-hand side of the panel here in this uh, breakout, there's a Q&A section, and I can see it filling up here, which is fantastic. Post your question. We'll uh, look at it. We'll sequence them up, and we'll answer as many as we can get through. Right. So number one, I'm going to hand off to, to Tim. Uh, we fielded a question earlier today, right, Tim? That's right. Adam was asking about importing a model and why he can't modify it. Can you guys see my screen okay? Can indeed. Awesome. So this is a very common one. Um, I see this, I don't know, almost weekly through the tech support line. Um, so there's a setting that you need to be aware of called 3D Interconnect. And we'll also take a look at some powerful tools to modify imported geometry. So I've just imported this step file using 3D Interconnect, which is the default behavior today in SOLIDWORKS. And you might notice this little icon over here that's pointing out to the side. This is a reference. So the whole point of 3D Interconnect, it enables me to collaborate more easily. So for example, Glenn could be working in a completely different CAD system. Bad choice, Glenn. <laughs> but you could do that. I mean, you could fool around, whatever. But if you send me an updated step model and I put that in my system, this is going to see that change and inherit it and bring it across. So that's a great benefit. I can connect to your CAD system more easily. But on the negative side of things, I can't go in and open this part using normal workflows. So often the, the support question we get is, why can't I, can I edit this imported part? Now, 
if you go into options and import, you can actually disable 3D interconnect. And if you re-import that file, it will not form that link. But just to show you an alternative workflow, I can right click and I can break the link to this component. Oh, which is not there since I just switched off 3D interconnect. <laughs> That's a nuance that I didn't expect seeing, but when you do live sessions, things like that happen. So let's see if break links back. There we go, break link. So breaking the link, it's no longer connected. And I can now open up that component model itself and make changes. So this brings me to the next topic. This is actually a file I got prior to this session from an uh, individual I've worked with for a long time. And he had a moldability issue that he detected in here. We use like undercut detection. We can actually go in and hide some of these things and reveal this undercut. So we're going to split this according to that plane there. And that undercut's going to mean we're going to need you know, a lifter or a slider to relieve that in order to mold it. Now, that's kind of a fragment of, um, I don't know, I don't want to call sloppy modeling habits because please don't go with some of my models. So you might think, well, maybe I could just patch that in real easy with like an extrusion, but unfortunately the nature of this, uh, it doesn't lend itself to a quick and easy patch. So let's just undo our way out of there. There we go. And the next thought that comes to my mind is old surfacing workflows where we offset, we extend, we trim it all together. That takes a lot of steps. So I want to introduce you a very powerful tool that you can find under the direct editing called Delete Face. And it does all of that surfacing rigmarole in one click. So when I got on the line and showed Paul this, his jaw dropped. He was just like, wow, I cannot believe it was possible to fix the file that fast. So let's just fix it. And then let's spend a moment longer just explaining what it does. So this fillet here, oftentimes on a molded part, you might need to remove a fillet to apply draft and then reapply the fillet so that it's moldable. So the delete face is going to go in and remove that face I've chosen and then extend these, which are planar faces until they trim together and it will trim it up just like that. So delete face is a great way to remove extraneous geometry. And I'm using this option delete and patch, which is what I'd normally recommend. Um, try that option first. If that fails, then you can just remove the face from the solid. It becomes a surface and use conventional surfacing tools to repair that. Lastly, Move face is a really powerful command that you can use offset. So I can make this important feature a little bit bigger. Hitting enter will bring that same command back up. I can grab that face and I could drag it this way and extend that all out a little bit. Or lastly, move face can also be used to rotate stuff. So I've used this successfully to place draft on the model, for example, by putting a couple of degrees of draft in here. And there you can go see the preview. So. Just to recap, we looked at 3D interconnect, and that by default was forming a connection to that imported model. You can break the link or switch that off to import it in the old uh, conventional techniques. And then we looked at move face and delete face to make changes to imported geometry. What did you guys think there? Was that, was that all right? That was great, man. I think uh, one of the things that sometimes catches people with the whole 3D interconnect functionality is that it's not for drawings, right? It's specifically for models when we're bringing in you know, stuff from other systems. But it also, it does get triggered if you're dealing with like um, neutral file formats as well, right? So. Yep. so just know there's two distinct kind of translators available and you can toggle them on and off. Hey, look, John likes that move face. That delete face has been... Amazing. It's one of my favorites to show yeah. for sure. Yeah. Here, you're up next and you've got one. Yeah, so... So I got an interesting question from a customer <clears throat> a while back. Um, and basically the question goes, if um, I have a bunch of sheet metal parts um, and I want to specifically find out which sheet metal part um, is using our correct bend tables, right? Um, for you guys who, who maybe aren't familiar with bend tables, uh, you know, they're really important to allow like based off of the machine type that you have and stuff, the amount of stretch that's going to be in that sheet metal part when it's flattened out. Right. So if you're using the incorrect bend table, you could be making bad parts. Right. So um, what they really wanted to do was go through all of their parts and find the right, you know, the ones that were using the right one and specifically, actually more importantly, the ones that were using the wrong bend table. And the trick behind this is that, um, the bend table information is actually part of the features inside of the, the tree. So if you come in here and you look at the sheet metal feature, 
we can see that uh, you know my bend table is is actually part of those features and it could be part of some of the other features as well so um, there is a solution that you could look at potentially here that's a, kind of an out of the box solution by using um, the design checker and we'll talk maybe about the design checker a little bit later there's another question but um, the problem with using the design checker here is that you get a report about like every single file you get a separate report right whether it was good or not um, so the design checker is good for a lot of things but not specifically for this so um, the method that I ended up using was um, using the SOLIDWORKS API to do this so I created a macro um, and I actually referenced one of the standard macros here. Let me go ahead and open it up. I always put a little note at the top here about where I got that macro from and what I've been changing and stuff. But um, here I'm specifying what bend table I'm specifically looking for, that location that's going to be inside of the feature. And um, you know I'm going to actually lo um, log all the bad parts out. So I actually end up using PDM to implement this and every file that gets approved, this runs on and it gets logged if it's a bad part. Um, but what you really have to do here is you have to go through and you have to traverse the tree, which is a, kind of a tricky thing to do. Um, and basically, one of the ways that you do it is you go through and there's some select options, some statements and stuff that we can use. Um, and specifically looking at, you know, when we're talking about sheet metal stuff, um, different features that could potentially have that, um, that type or that uh, specific information, in it, whether it has a bend table in it or not. So I have it broken up. Uh, the, the default template has these statements in it. And it looks complicated, but these are all just different types of sheet metal features, right? And some of them could have a bend table and some of them don't. And so, you know, if it, it's possible for it to have a bend table, all I do is I check that to see if um, it's using the right one. If it's not, then I, I log it out and we're good to go. And they do this uh, using a case statement. So um, if we were to run through, I actually added another thing to this specific uh, macro where I'm debug printing what feature it's on. So if we run through this really quick, you can see it starts out at the comments. So let's see if we just go um, to the next one here. We're at favorites. And these are the features that are in the tree, right? You can't see some of them because they're hidden in my <laughs> uh, sensors. Um, annotation, surface bodies. All right, we started making it down here. There's my planes. Hey, Garrett. Uh, yeah. Quick question for my own benefit. I forget. You're using a hotkey there. Is that like F8 to jump to the next? So line? that's actually a really good question. So F8 would take you to the next line. F5 will loop either run to the end or run until it hits the debugger again. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, your, uh, yeah, your point break. Thank so you. here, I actually hit a sheet metal feature, which would then put me in potentially to like one of these options, right? And there it actually printed out that the bend table that it's using here is this location and runs through my statement basically to print that out and put it inside of a notepad file. So that was the solution that I came up with. Um, hopefully that kind of makes sense to you guys. But I know that I, I always forget about the potential for automation, right? you think about how much work it would take to do that manually and just being able to establish that routine that can traverse the tree and tell you if something's in there, mm -hmm. it, it saves you hours, but it's I, I always, not, not as complex life. either as people might think. You mentioned it's, it at the beginning, really there's good. lots of examples that you can build on. And I find sometimes it's just manipulate a few variables, copy and paste a block of code, manipulate a few variables, and I've got something really close. Yeah, I think the, a great place to get started with that is looking at uh, macros to handle custom properties. A lot of people do that sort of thing. I spend a lot of time on that. Um, but if you're really looking into to getting into this, I think the training inside of the Solid Professor stuff is, is really good. So I definitely recommend going there and taking a look. Awesome. Hey, I'm seeing a ton of great questions come in. Saba, Rob, Jordan, David, Deepak. We're gonna oh, no. Deepak asking a question. Uh, but oh, Jared, no. I know you, you took one earlier today. Uh, <laughs> take it away. Yeah, uh, kind of changing to another program, uh, SolidWorks Electrical. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. Uh, but really common question is how to back up all of your data. Uh, you've got a lot of projects, you spend a lot of time 
uh, you know, building your libraries, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so when we've got SolidWorks Electrical launched, uh, you've got this archive environment button right here um, on the file tab. Uh, once you select that, it's going to bring up a little wizard. And as we move through the wizard, uh, I would say probably one of the more important settings would be this checkbox right here, where you can set a reminder to remind you to run the environment archive. The environment archive, as you can see from the various tabs, it's going to cover everything. Um, you get a list here, um, how many different components, symbols, 2D footprints, etc. cetera. Um, by default, it should be grabbing everything, but if you did want to exclude certain things, you can, you know, obviously you can toggle things on or off. Jared, I actually saw a, a support question this morning that was related to this. Um, mm -hmm. They had tried moving their environment and they mm -hmm. weren't able to use their 2D footprints. Right, so I guess more likely the the issue that they had there was when they ar archived their environment, they just didn't have the footprints selected as part of that archive. Right? Yeah, again, by default, you know, everything should be selected when with the environment archive. Um, there are other types of archiving where you can archive a specific project, you can archive your individual libraries, uh, but again, the environment archive is going to grab all of it. Uh, it will generate a zip file containing all of this data uh, that can then <clears throat> be moved to a new system and unarchived from any given client system to restore all of that data. Um, as you do move through here, though, you'll see, uh, you know, you can you have some actions uh, that you can set again. By default, everything should be getting added to this archive. Um, and, and again, this just steps through, gives you a good, you know, list of everything. Uh, you've got your descriptions, your names, uh, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but as you run through this, uh, again, you might want to verify that everything is set the way you want it. Uh, there are a number of tabs to step through because uh, it's grabbing quite a bit of information. But as we get towards the end here, you can see it's going to run certain elements, build those lists. Um, again, this is out of the box functionality, and it is the recommended uh, and fully supported method for backing up your SolidWorks electrical data. For me, it's, it's probably a bad practice of what I do, but whenever I open this guy up, I always go to the little arrow buttons at the top. I go to the very end and hit finish. You can do that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can just kind of click never change anything. through over never here, yep, and you can jump right to that finish. It's going to give you, you know, one last little summary of everything, and then you're able to finish out, and it will then begin generating that singular zip file. Uh, which is really nice because, you know, if, if you've ever backed up like PDM, you know, you need a copy of the archives, you need database backups, you need that dot dat file from the archive tool. So there's kind of multiple things you're keeping track of, whereas with SolidWorks Electrical, this utility is just going to put it all in one nice little package for you. So then it, let's say you install, a, you know, the SolidWorks Electrical server components on a new server. Again, get a singular client connected to that server and then do the unarchive environment. It's going to let me choose where to save it out to and begin doing its thing. So uh, again, uh, I would highly recommend <coughs> running this probably at least, again, the default. You can see there when you enable the reminder is for 30 days. Um, if you were adding more data, high amounts, new projects every week, might want to change that reminder uh, to weekly. Um, or again, you could even run this every day if you really wanted to. So. Awesome, man. Good tip. We always want to see you back that up. It's uh... Yeah, you always want to know the data is safe. <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Jared. Sure. Let's Let's come over to me if we can. Um, I'm going to try and hit two questions here if I can, Ooh. and I'm working on a third. So first up, 
Saba, you asked a great question about um, simulating and graphing insertion forces when two parts are kind of clipped together. Working on an example there that we'll, we'll come back to a bit later, if I can get it together. Um, but you asked another great question about, you know, what products are available for making assessments of sustainability and, and the sustainable impact of, of products. And so, you know, a while back, uh, DS SolarWorks released a uh, an item called SolarWorks Sustainability. Sustainability Express is in every um, license of SolarWorks and the sustain full sustainability package is in uh, professional, I believe, right? I think they moved it down from premium, yeah. I was going to see if you got it or not, Glenn, before I went. <laughs> well, we'll say professional for now and you can I'll verify. call in afterwards if I'm wrong. Um, I, I will say it's, it's certainly not perfect, um, but it's making an assessment of, of the impact of, of your material choices, essentially, your material and manufacturing process choices. Each part, you, you get an opportunity to define how it's made. Is it injected molded? Is it stamped sheet metal? Is it whatever? And what the material is. Um, from there, it'll make assessments of the, the carbon footprint, the energy consumption from cradle to grave, from raw material extraction all the way through to end of life. Um, it's kind of a, an exercise, you know, process unto itself. So I'd really recommend checking out uh, the onboard tutorial um, about sustainability. And I really hope to see more development in this space in SolidWorks because this is, this is all we have at the moment, but there's so much more to explore and it's so topical that, um, and it's so important to us all, of course, right? So as we'll of 2021, it's only available in SolidWorks Premium. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the main one I wanted to get to came in earlier today, um, came from from Art, shared a question earlier in the, in the lounge and, and Ivan also chimed in to say, hey, that's a problem for me as well. And the, the challenge is this. I've got a sample model here that has a, a weldment. It has a multi-body sheet metal. And then it has four regular parts, right? If I want to express all of those items in a bill of materials, I can do that, right? Um, I can click on my bill of materials here. You see my weldment, my sheet metal. I've got the the, the length and well, the quantity of all the, the individual items and my two sheet metal bodies. I haven't done a very smart name of naming them. But what you'll find in SolidWorks 2021 is that all this goes away if you use any option other than indented. So if I go parts only or top level only, none of that detail is available to me, okay? Uh, if you caught Jacob's presentation earlier this morning, um, you might have seen that there was an enhancement for SolidWorks 2022 that removes that restriction. So I've just got a little screenshot here. Doesn't matter the type of um, bill of materials you, you wanna use, you can individually call out multi-body items within it and balloon those and do whatever you need to, you know, as of that new release. So that I think <laughs> is one of those issues um, that, that Art and Ivan reported. Okay, who wants next? I guess that's me, All right? Okay, uh, let me give you... Okay, so the next question that we had was, um, it was from a teacher. They wanted to know how they could um, you know, correct essentially their, their students' work, right? Um, if they had a, this is the right file and this is the student copy, how do I tell what they, <laughs> whether they did it correctly or not? Which I could see, you know, being a pretty time consuming if you're, a, if you're an instructor. So I'll go ahead and show you um, at least the way that I would go about that. Don't worry, it's not gonna involve the API, at least not right away. Um, so if I had this part, and this is my, my kind of seed part, 
um, the one instructor did. Um, you know, I've run into this a couple of times. Honestly, the way that I've done this in the past has been more through the material properties, looking at the mass of the part. So that's that's honestly where I would recommend that you start, um, making sure that that mass is correct or it's close, right? Um, if they did it correct and you're specifically looking at the features and exactly how they did it, that mass should be spot on. Um, however, you know, if you actually need to compare like the features in geometry, um, there's not really any way to do it in mass. If you want to look at that level of detail, which you need to do, um, I think you mentioned in your question actually about using the um, design checker. And the trouble with using the design checker here, even though that, that's a great option, I really like the design checker, is that um, it doesn't really have any good uh, comparison against a, a part, right? It's going to use your document properties. So the things that the document, che um, document checker can can actually check here are, are typically going to be your document properties or custom properties, um, or whether there's certain things about the features that are correct, um, not that it matches an existing feature set. So um, outside of checking the mass, what you could do is you could use um, the compare functionality. So you can either compare existing features or geometry. Um, for something like this, where they could have modeled it in like different orientations or used different features, but it would technically be correct still, I would probably do a geometry comparison, right? And um, I would set up my standard part here, and then I would grab the student copy that I'm going to check against. I should probably have that open already. So let's see. Got my student copy right here. And you could have all the student copies kind of in the background, and I'd probably manage it through like a, a, a custom property or something like that. Um, I would get the students used to actually putting in custom properties into files as well. But if we go to tools, compare, compare geometry here. Again, I'm going to do my instructor copy, and then I'll check the student. And uh, we could run a comparison of the geometry. Right, and we could see, we can use filters here to see what's different. All right, so we can see this whole position changed. They didn't quite get that lined up. So um, if you wanted to save that as a report, you could save that and you could send that to the student. Um, but that's typically the method that I would use for something like this. Garrett, I've helped manufacturers utilize this when they get, you know, Rev2 for a part they're molding or manufacturing. You know, maybe you don't just take it for granted what they told you they changed, but you do the comparison <laughs> exactly what it Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the design checker functionality, I think that something that people often forget is that that can actually be implemented into PDM as well. So if you are checking against standards and stuff like that, that's one of, I think, my favorite tools to implement uh, because it can really change, like, I don't know, I hate checking people's files, honestly. I, I don't like that sort of work. So checking to see whether their dimensions are overlapping or some of that stuff is just the machine can do it really easily. So um, I really like the design checker for that. Cool. So let's see. I think next uh, we had a question, I think, about PDM, right, Jared? Next. Yeah. Uh, I had someone wondering about how to essentially assign a file to somebody and then via the workflow, also have it send out a notification to that individual. Um, so I'll just bring up my screen again here real quick. That one actually used to come up all the time when I was doing PDM implementations, right? People wanted to know, like, during the approval process, how can I assign it to somebody? But it's not really part of the standard. Yeah, set, right? Ba yeah, basically, uh, I create a dispatch, which is similar to creating a SolidWorks macro. Um, Right click on it, administrate actions, it's going to open it up for us. Uh, here's the dispatch I've created. Um, and, and basically, this is a way of, of, again, without necessarily typing out lines of code to create uh, some automation and create essentially a, a macro. Um, so this block start, block end, that's basically just delineating any files that I select. So if I select one file or if I were to select multiple files, it's going to run for all the files that I've selected. Uh, I've also chose created a list of the engineer's usernames 
And then I'm going to be assigning that to a val variable uh, as the value for assigned to. Uh, so uh, that's the basics of the dispatch and how it is going to behave. And then you can see here for this submit for approval transition notifications tab, I've created a conditional notification. And essentially here, the recipients are going to be mapped to that value that gets written to that variable via the dispatch script. Um, that's pretty cool. I think to... that's some functionality a lot of people don't know. I mean, it's relatively new, right? The conditional notifications stuff. Yeah, it is. But uh, but yeah, it's it's as simple as uh, didn't even have to set any conditions necessarily. Again, it's going to be reading whatever value is written to that variable and trigger based off of that. So that's going to have to match like a username or a group of people for it Correct. To... Yeah, exactly. Um, so if we actually go into the local vault view, I've got a file here. I'm just going to give it a right click. It's taking a little bit. Let's see. There we go. And with a single action of changing the state. I'm going to submit it for approval. You can see right now it's under editing. I'm going to submit it for that approval, but I want to be able to assign it to someone and then have them be notified. So submit for the approval. It's going to build the, the list of files that need to change state here. Should just be this one. Again, the way the dispatch uh, was written is, is it will grab multiple files if I were to select multiple files kind of. Yeah. So, you know, here you can add your comments, you know, submit for approval and, you know, the notification. This will be the comment in the actual notification as well. You know, please approve. And so then I'm going to execute that state change. And that is going to then trigger this drop down where I get to select a given user. It's like Again, you dropping it on somebody's desk right here. Right. Yeah, correct. And and again, this is based on that uh, dispatch script. So I'm going to choose an engineer, say OK. And as this processes, we should see this assigned to here on the data card. Might need to refresh my explore view. Let's see. There we go. So now it's actually written to the data card as well so that that's visible quickly and easily. And then if I actually log out as the user I'm currently logged in with and go back into the vault as that user, oops. once you get logged in, uh, you know, the, your notifications, you should get a pop up basically in your Windows notification tray as well as a, a, a chime. Um, but just to show you real quick, sometimes it, it might take a little while to go through. We just go directly to the inbox there in the tools drop down. You'll now see that I have a new notification and it's got my notes in it and it only went to this one particular user. So other users aren't being bombarded with notifications. It's only going to who actually it's been assigned to and who needs to look at it nice. and, and then put continue on through the workflow. So. That's awesome, man. I'm not not typically an advocate for notifications other than like the delayed in state one, but I do like that. Yeah, again, it kind of streamlines things, you know, so that you're not just bombarding everyone with notifications for every transition. You're you're really targeting in on who needs to, to be made aware of the, the next steps. So nice. Thanks, Jared. Mm -hmm. Tim, I think you got one ready, right? I do, I do. So David had asked in the Q&A, how do I fully define a sketch with text? And I'm going to guess everybody on the line is about to learn a little something because I sure didn't know the answer to this going in. So let's just put some text in here and do it like so. Now, one tool I use often is this command search up here. And something you can find in here is fully defined sketch. So you can tell SolidWorks to just go fully define this. Now, I'm not going to tell you it's going to build the design intent that <laughs> might, but it'll it'll fully define things. So what you can observe is it's 
dimensioning to a point off to the side here. So we can let the system do that, or we can do it ourselves. There was a number of folks in the uh, Q and A asking about fully defining. That could be a, at least it's defined. So I can, you know, dimension this myself, and it most certainly will re fully define this thing. Let's go ahead and make that happen. But one anomaly I notice is anybody notice the color here's a bit off. <laughs> A little bit. What do you guys see? Sketch like, just shows fully defined, though. It is. But normally, we expect the sketch to go black, right, as we de fully define elements. So this is a bit of an anomaly. The, the point we dimensioned to did go black, but the sketch text itself did not. So it's fully defined. It just shows up off. Now, the way I normally define or position sketch text is I align them to curves. So I can come in here and choose a curve to attach that to. And then I can say, you know, I want it centered or justified some which way or another. And to me, this is fully defined, but I can't move it. But the sketch point right here is not fully defined, oddly enough, right? Anyway, if you just, you know, make an inference, <laughs> something like that, it's now technically fully defined. But um, so I guess there's two ways. One dimension to that sketch point, but more often I'll use lines or curves that align the sketch to them. So David, I hope that get you going a little further, fully defining your sketches. That was an interesting one. Anybody Tim, one of, my, yeah. one of my favorite things when I was teaching the essentials was showing people how they can tell whether their sketch is fully defined or not. Because there's like six different ways that they could tell, right? And like, I always like going around and pointing. It's like, hey, you know, like you could look down the bottom right corner. You can look at the color on the screen. You can look at the feature in the tree. Like yeah. there, there's no, so no. many different ways to tell. Right, I would no just go minus, boom, so boom, boom. Down here, another way, and then yeah, yeah the, the color. Good ad, thanks. Awesome, Garrett. I think you're on deck. That's me again. Sweet. I'm ready if you're not. No, I'm ready. I'm, yes. Glenn, I'm always ready. <laughs> right. I'm just going to show the same part every time, and. It works because they're all sheet metal questions, apparently, that I'm dealing with today. So it, it's all good. Uh, so one of the questions I think we got pretty, like, almost right away today was about mirrored sheet metal parts, right? So um, when you go and you mirror sheet metal parts, um, you, there's a couple of different ways that you can handle it. Um, you can have it be, like, a completely derived part, right? So in that case, it doesn't actually have a feature tree. So um, you can do a lot of uh, sheet metal like mirrored parts a couple of different ways. You can actually throw this in an assembly, but you don't have to do that to create the left-hand version or the mirrored part. If you just select a plane that you want to mirror across, you can go to um, insert, <clears throat> mirror part. And if I were just to accept it how it is, I would not have a feature tree. I can actually show you guys real quick. It's, uh, it's mirrored, it's a solid body. I could choose what things I want to bring over, but no features, right? It's all completely driven off of that other part. But, you know, let's say that part's going to be a little bit different than this one, but I don't want to start over from scratch. What you can do is, again, you know, select that plane. You go through the same process, insert mirror part. And what we need to do, because it, we don't want it to update from that other file, is to break the link. It's, it's really as simple as just that checkbox there. Once we do that, We'll get a folder here with our features. All right, and at the end, you'll see there's this move copy body transition that are, that's basically reorienting that part into that, uh, into that position. So um, that's one way to do it. You could also, I guess, technically do a derived configuration. However, it wouldn't be a separate file, which I think was part of the question, so. Awesome. And that was for Ben. Uh, he, I think he asked that question three minutes before we started this morning. <laughs> um, so it's a great time. So we've we've lost Tim here. He's off for the wrap up to set up the wrap up session. No, you're still here. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce. I was trying to answer a question that got kicked out, but I think I'm gonna leave. Thank you all. I'll see you in a moment. So Tim's off to the main stage to get ready for uh, our closing session. So join us there. Um, there's prizes to give away and some great guests to still share yeah. i must say there are way more questions than we were expecting today and our promise to you is that everything here will get answered we'll get answers out through our youtube channel or blog or uh, we will message you but we'll answer everything you you've brought to us but 
and there's way more that we're going to be able to get to, which is a really, really cool thing. It's been great to have you interact. So I've got one here. Let's, uh, let's pop this open. Um, a question from Saba, um, and it was a really good one, a really common scenario. And it, well, no, it's basically a question of how do you model an, an analysis for an insertion force, right? Of, of two objects sort of coming together um, like a clip on a, a backpack buckle or, or whatever it might be. And my five minute example from this does, does not look very pretty at all. But the answer to the question is that it always needs to be a nonlinear analysis because when you're doing that sort of insertion, you're sequencing events, okay? And, and what a nonlinear analysis allows you to do is to increment through a study, uh, seeing change after each analysis step. So this is a really simple analysis. The part at the bottom is fixed. The part at the top moves down and hopefully this long arm will deflect around the little not notch here, right? Um, the only yeah input is is this movement it's going to move three quarters of an inch in the downward direction um, it runs really quickly i can do it live after dismissing a couple of messages it's basically it's going to sequence down until it collides and then it will start to splay out i like that you used a 2d simplification here and and symmetry right that that makes it run a lot faster <laughs> well, I kind of cheated, and it's just really thin. Oh, okay. But you could have done 2D simplification, <laughs> right? Have, absolutely. Yep. Um, now, and but the question was, what's the force, right? And so I've got to extract that. Um, I do that by creating, by asking for the result force, monitoring where we push, and I can print out a nice chart of what that insertion kind of profile looks like. This one's in Newtons. Uh, you can go into this topic a lot deeper, obviously, but hopefully that answers the, the, the basic question there, Saba. It has to be a nonlinear analysis to, to do anything like this. I feel like there was a joke there about Newtons having been, having left already, but yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I guess I will take a crack at Deepak's question, actually. Yes. Um, yeah, so actually before we leave, Garrett, we've answered a couple of the questions in chat. In the Q&A section, there's a place where you can look at the answered questions. Um, check out those. And look, like I said, we'll answer everything. So yes. we'll, uh, we'll find a way to get to you. Go ahead, Garrett. Yeah, so there's a couple of kind of red flags for me in Deepak's question here. So it says he said, sometimes uh, dimension extension lines don't show up um, when, they're, when he's doing a detail view. Um, any specific reason that that might be, and is it possible to fix it? Um, so sometimes is one of those things that's a key word that uh, kind of clues you into possibly something that's going on there, um, as well as that it's on a drawing and specifically in a detail view. So um, the, the tricky thing here without having the files to be able to reproduce it is that I, I do have to kind of take an educated guess about what's going on. Um, more than likely, this is some sort of a graphics issue Deepak, if it's happening sometimes, but not all the time. Um, and what you would really want to do is use the RX tool. Um, I'm sure that you you guys are probably familiar with the RX tool by now, but that's from a troubleshooting standpoint, that is one of the things that we we always use about the support level, like just all the time, right? So if you go to your start menu and you type in RX, right, you run the RX tool. Um, if you have an issue like this and it's intermittent or, you know, sometimes it's happening and sometimes it's not, like, there's two things that you want to do. You want to run it through in OpenGL mode, which I think would probably give you more consistency about it, it works all the time or it never works. You would know for sure that it's not a graphics card issue there. Or if it's happening maybe on a certain computer, but it's not happening on another, you'd want to use this other option to bypass your settings. But um, my guess is that it's most likely this option if you were to run through. Um, it's it's probably 
having to do with something with the driver that you're using. And that's something I think that we we ran into quite a bit, like in some of the newer versions of like Windows when they're kind of actively updating your graphics driver, um, trying to make sure that you're on the certified appropriate driver for the version of SOLIDWORKS you're using has become a lot more tricky. So hopefully that helps. Fantastic. Jared, you got anything, or I've got another one queued up. I've just been clarifying a couple of questions some people had in the Q and A. So, um, great. Yeah. Hey, Jared, uh, Garrett, you wanna? Oh, I'm just showing my screen. So there? sorry. I've got one more. <laughs> All right. There was a question from from Mark earlier today in the lounge, and uh, quite a simple one, but it might have some hidden depth. So his question was. You know, I'm missing the evaluate tab in my toolbar. And it's obviously something you use a lot. It's got mass properties. It's got measure. It's got interference detection. I am in here all the time. And so I can see how it's annoying if it's not there. Now, if everything is working correctly um, and you don't see it here in an assembly, or a drawing or a part. It's in there for every item. So, you know, it should be there. You should be able to right click the t command manager tab, go to tabs, and hopefully should live in the list uh, with the check mark, not next to it. Right. And it should be as simple as that to get the, that back. Now, if that doesn't work, if that's not there, you know, it comes back to some of the things that you can do for any SolidWorks settings. And there's really two things I go to all the time. One is I will periodically take a copy of my SolidWorks settings using the copy settings wizard and just kind of keep that on file. And then if so, if anything strange happens or you set some obscure option and that you can never find again, you've got that kind of backup, which will just reprogram you back to where you are. It can also be good to go across the office and tap a colleague on the shoulder and say, hey, I need to copy your SolidWork settings. I've, I've messed something up with mine. And that'll reset things like the toolbar layouts, um, options, everything. The other way to do this kind of brute force is in the, solid, in the registry. Um, I'll get off the serial number screen. Uh, so the, the Windows registry, you got to know what you're doing if you're in here, but um, it's not so bad. HKEY current user, SolidWorks, software, SolidWorks. If you delete that um, and then launch SolidWorks again, you'll get the factory settings uh, right off the bat. So that can be a good way to uh, either troubleshoot. I, I'd say what best practice, you should probably take a copy of it before you delete it. I always just rename it, Glenn, too. Yeah, we'll like, yep. I mean, Great. sometimes I'll delete it, but renaming is a good way to be able to actually restore it if you need to. Yeah. So the simple answer to that question, right click, look for the tab. If that's not playing ball, take a look at those kind of core settings, the copy settings, or even go all the way to the registry if you want to, if you want a nuclear option. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how we do we get? We got probably five minutes to go before we should send you back to the um, the main stage. I could take a crack at this three D printing question. If you want? Oh, okay. I was going to answer that too, but you'll do a better job. So here we oh, go. Oh, will I? Okay. I don't know. We'll see. You'll have to let me know after I'm done how how it goes. So I do a lot of three D printing. Honestly, like um, I did did a lot for my job and do a lot of home for my kids. And um, so the, the tricky thing in your question, so it sounds like um, it's basically about designing and your 3D printer has essentially a tolerance of like one millimeter while you're printing, right? Um, I think that that is essentially the key of, of what you're dealing with there. And honestly, like it's a, it's a tricky thing to say, but um, 
you should be like when I design parts for my 3D printer, I know the tolerances of that machine, right? And um, when I'm dealing with the Mark Forge printers here at work, I use uh, like a third of a millimeter for my fit tolerance. At home, when I'm designing in PLA on my my cheap printer, I'm designing with uh, a half a millimeter tolerance, right? I'm giving a half a millimeter of space. So it it really depends on um, the the settings of your printer. I would say like something that I need to do better about on my printer at home is go through and do like e-step calibration so that my printer is actually more accurate. Um, doing things like printing out like little test cubes and stuff like that and verifying dimensions with your calipers and then going back and adjusting your e-steps appropriately will really help you to, to get a lot tighter tolerances for your printing, so. Yeah, I actually interpreted the, the question from Rob slightly differently. And, and essentially, Rob is saying that he sees um, when he prints in PLA, I think, mm -hmm. um, he sees a one millimeter distortion in the X direction, um, but no distortion in the vertical direction, right? And to me, that makes me think about differential scaling. <laughs> Um, and so there might be a combination of techniques between what Garrett's talking yeah. about. And if I you am. can't fix your printer, you should use Glenn's technique here. Yeah. <laughs> and and this is not perfect. This is designed for plastics, really. Um, but if you go to Insert Features Scale, okay, by default, it's going to look like this. And if you were making an injection molded part, you could say, my part has 5% shrinkage, so make it 5% bigger, and then I'll cut the mold cavity. Right. This is not a plastic part, but you can imagine. If you unselect that box, you've now got control over the X, Y, and Z axes independently. So it's a percentage, so it's not like a millimeter. It's not a measurement, but you could put in an appropriate value and only stretch it in a single direction. So it might be another option that's, that's there for you, uh, Rob. Okay. Anything else here, team, that we think we can tackle in a in a two minute? Well, there there is a question about how how you show the grain direction in three D views, right? And that's um, I don't have an example that I can pull up right away for you, but there, there's a couple of things that you can do, right? So one, you could use your own annotation to do that if you're specifically talking about three D views, but um, if you're looking at something that's built into the software, MBD actually has that capability. Um, they added, I think in 2020, the ability to show like grain direction and bend tables and stuff inside of um, your 3D model space, essentially. So, yep, that's that's the method I would use. Um, and there's a lot, lot more to MBD than that, of course, but that's yeah. kind of the out of the box functionality. And maybe a last one to just discuss. We got a series of questions from Miguel. Um, he's asking about using flow simulation to to determine how a cooling unit, like an AC, might cool a room for a specific uh, um, application of designing wine cellars for for temperature control. Mm -hmm. um, and and flow simulation could be really good at that for the space. Now, the assumption we generally make is that you're buying an air conditioner off the shelf, right? That you're not designing the inner mechanics of the air conditioner. You're not modeling how refrigerant flows through it. That's a different physics problem. But if you're just, you know, buying an air conditioner or a heat pump or some other heating or cooling system, putting it in a room and wanting to know how the air needs to circulate to maintain a temperature. That we becomes a lot simpler problem, right? When yeah, you we established that air conditioner given. is basically a, a heat sink, a heat, well, the opposite of a heat source, <laughs> right? It'll remove energy from the system. Um, it'll blow air in a certain way. And we can set that up and see the impact. Um, there's a whole module of the flow simulation software designed for HVAC analysis. And so there's some cool parameters to individual comfort and, and to map the space and um, some cool stuff we can do there. So that's certainly an application that, that the software can handle and a really interesting one for to be brought up here. So thanks mm -hmm. for that. There was a question too about uh, 
creating flat bills and materials and stuff. And I would just point you to maybe like assembly costing. There's not another like really great way to do that inside of SolidWorks. So um, you could do a lot of bill materials management and stuff, but uh, it's either that, or if you're looking at kind of an enterprise level, then you need to start looking at like SolidWorks Manage that has that ability to roll up those bills and materials for you. Awesome. Well, unfortunately we will need to, to, to pull the cord there. Um, thank you so much for the input uh, and the questions. We will, like I said, make sure everything gets answered. Uh, so keep an eye on our channels, YouTube, our blog, um, our maybe even social media. We'll have to figure out how to get these out, but we'll make sure every question gets addressed. And uh, we really appreciate your interaction today. We apologize if we didn't get to your question. Um, uh, it's great to have so many people here.